When I was about 14, I saw on television a program, a documentary about this hallucinatory drug called LSD and was heralded as an amazing miracle drug, but it began to get abused and they found that it had terrible side effects and my buddies began using LSD and they tried to talk me into it and I said, no, I'm happy, I don't need this stuff. But one day, I can't understand why I did this, I thought, I'm gonna try it. I guess it was the power of peer group pressure. And I looked up and I saw an hallucination of a ladder of the word why, starting wide and getting narrow as it went right up through the ceiling to the heavens. Why am I going to die? Why am I gonna lose everything? Why is this thing called death gonna snatch everything from me that I hold precious? I was cut in two. And for the first time in my life, when I understood that I'd sinned against God, I understood the cross. I needed God's mercy. I needed his forgiveness. Well, Ray, it's an honor to be here in Living Water Ministries here in California. We are super grateful that you've opened your doors to us. For those who don't know you, who maybe have never seen you, can you just introduce yourself to those who are watching on the other side of the screen? Yeah, I'm really a nobody from nowhere with nothing but a love for God. My name is Ray Comfort. You might notice a very slight accent. That's because I'm from the country of New Zealand. I was born there twice. I was brought up in a non-Christian home. My mum was Jewish, my dad was Gentile. And uh, when she met my dad, she got wiped off by a family. They just wrote her off. And, uh, and so I was brought up with no Christian instruction, no Jewish instruction, just left to find my own way. Very, very happy childhood. I lived about 50 yards from the beach and I trained my mum to raise a flag on our roof when dinner was ready, when I was out surfing. So very, very happy childhood. One thing that stays fixed in my memory is an experience I had when I was 18. I went to go surfing and took my dog with me. My dog wasn't well trained, I didn't bother to train him. His name was Geordie, and whenever I mentioned I was going to, that I was going to the beach, he would just go wild, run around in circles. Happy little chap, and he ran ahead of me down the sidewalk, and uh, he began to run towards the road, so I yelled out his name, Geordie, Geordie, come back, come back. And he was so excited, he took no notice, ran onto the road, and he was hit by a car. And I remember it was a slow motion experience. I remember seeing his body go under that car, out the back. I dropped my surfboard, it was a brand new board, just dropped it on the road, ran out without looking, I remember now, picked up my little dog, ran back home, sat at the base of our driveway with the dog in my arms, hole in his head, blood dripping from his mouth. And I looked up and a man stopped his car opposite where I was sitting, walked across, it was the guy that hit the dog. He put his hand on my shoulder and he burst into tears. And it was so traumatic. And that night, we received a phone call from the vet and he said we had to put your dog to sleep. And I remember thinking for the first time in my life about the issues of life and death. Why do people die? Why did my dog die? Why did my grandma die? My grandpa, why was my mum and dad gonna die? It made no sense. And then uh, I, be I began working at a bank. I worked for three years in a bank. That's when I met my wife, Sue. Left the bank, started my own business. If someone said, what do you do for a living? I'd say, I mind my own business. What do you do? My business was a surf shop and a leather uh, gear shop. I used to make jackets just like this to order for people. And I came in a wave, actually. There was a movie called Easy Rider, which had a, a hero in the movie. The star wore a cowboy jacket with fringes on it. So I made one because I liked it. Ended up making about two or three hundred. I can make them to order for people within two hours. And so I was very, very happy in my life. Married my wife, Sue. We had our own house. I was only 20 years old. My own business to do what I wanted. And then I had an experience, and I'm going to share with you today, that I haven't shared for 50 years. It's been a dirty little secret. And there's a reason I've held on to the secret. My kids who are grown up don't even know about this. What do I share with, with you? Because it's so relevant to what I'm talking about. The surf scene uh, is made up of guys that just love thrills. When the surf was good, they'd take risks. When there was no surf, they were bored to tears. So they're very open to drugs. Five of them actually died. I wrote a book called My Friends Are Dying years ago, which opened a ministry for me. But during that time, I remember they were taking LSD. When I was about 14, I saw on television a program, a documentary about this hallucinatory drug called LSD. And uh, they said how great it was because it helped psychologists and psychiatrists reach back into people's hearts and find out what was 
really deep in their psyche. And was healed as an amazing miracle drug, but it began to get abused and they found that it had terrible side effects. And my buddies began using LSD. And they tried to talk me into it. And I said, no, I'm happy. I don't need this stuff. But one day, I can't understand why I did this. I thought, I'm going to try it. I guess it was the power of peer group pressure. My buddies kept pressuring me. So I went around to a friend's place and I said, I'd like to try LSD. So he got a tiny little thing about the size of my pinky, cut it in half and gave me two halves and said, take it with a friend. Never, ever done anything like this before. It was very surreal for me to be doing this. And so I took this and nothing kind of happened for a first half hour. We just listened to music. And then I drove home. It was a 10 mile drive from where I was. I do not remember driving. It was just weird. It was very dangerous. And then I drove into the city to pick up my wife, newly married. And I remember stopping to let people get in front of my car, just cross the road and weeping at the thought of all those people that they were going to die. Mm. And I was just filled with this emotion. And uh, I remember thinking to myself, I will not tell my wife what I've done because I know she'd be really upset. And I determined not to tell her. As soon as she got in the car, I just said I took some LSD. It was like my mouth ran off without my brain being in gear. And she just looked at me and said, I'm so disappointed in you. And we had to go to her parents' house that night. For two hours, I was as high as a kite. And I bluffed it. Sue covered for me when I burst out laughing for no reason. I remember seeing an hallucination of my dog, a little white dog, walking about eight inches above the ground, floating in front of the television. I said, look, there's my dog. And it was just weird. And here's where it, here's where it became interesting. And this is the point. Whenever I've shared my testimony in the past, I've said, as a happy young man, I looked at my wife, who was asleep at the time, newly married, and thought she could die and I'd have nothing to live for with all my material goods. And tears just dripped down my cheeks as I thought about the fact of the futility of life. What I didn't bring out was the thing that caused that deep thought was LSD. Now, let me qualify this. LSD is a very dangerous drug. A friend of mine around that time stepped off a thousand foot cliff. Her name was Janet, and she died wow. on LSD. Another friend took drugs. They don't know what it was that he took, but he was in a, a mental facility for 12 months. And for that 12 months, he didn't say one word. And this is a very dangerous drug and it's still very, very popular. But it did open my mind and that night when I looked at my wife, it was LSD that pulled something out of my spirit that I just can't understand. It was just so deep, these thoughts about life and death and futility. And I looked up and I saw an hallucination of a ladder of the word why, starting wide and getting narrow as it went right up through the ceiling to the heavens. Why? Why am I alive? Why am I going to die? Why am I going to lose everything? Why is this thing called death going to snatch everything from me that I hold precious? My mum and dad, brother and sister, and uh, everything I hold dear. And that night, I just cried out, why? Didn't cry out to God. Didn't even think God was hearing me. Although I used to pray every night out of habit, I said the Lord's Prayer, but it was just an empty kind of thing that I did to get to sleep. But God heard that cry, and uh, six months later, I came to Christ. Now, the reason I've held on to that story and not told anyone the secret that I, that I used LSD was because, number one, I was the director of a drug prevention center on the city, in the city that I was in. It was in the city of, and it was uh, on the street called High Street, which is an unfortunate choice of street names for a drug center, High Street. It was called the Drug Prevention Center. But what happened is when I came to Christ that night, when I cried out, I saw the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, by them of old you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her in his heart. When I saw those words, I was cut in two. I didn't realize God saw my thought life. And for the first time in my life, when I understood that I'd sinned against God, I understood the cross. I needed God's mercy. I needed his forgiveness. So that night on that surf trip, about three hours from my home, I came to Christ. I was brand new on the inside. And what happened was that what happened to me happened in California to literally thousands of people across the country. There was what, called, what was called the Jesus Movement. Happened right throughout our country in New Zealand. It was a big deal. Mm. Thousands of people marched on the streets, did marches for Jesus. 
But what happened is when I came to Christ, a uh, television crew wanted to know what had happened to me. Now, I didn't look like this. This is reasonably well tasted. The idea with surface is you try and look as much like seaweed as you can. And I'd arrived. I had hair on my shoulders. It was sun bleached, looked like plumber's rope. And my clothes were very strange, you know, big floral shirts and turquoise pants, etc. The television wanted to know what had happened to me because it kind of radical. And so I gave my testimony, and in that testimony, I shared what I've shared with you today, that I took LSD. And my mum saw it and was so heartbroken that I was a drug addict in her eyes, and her friend's eyes. Well, it was like me taking a spoonful of alcohol and then being called a, a, an alcoholic. But my mum didn't understand that, and she was really heartbroken when she saw that television program. So I determined to leave that out of my testimony. It's been 50 years since I shared that. But I was made a brand new person in Christ, and it was kind of radical uh, because I'd found everlasting life. It was like an explosion of gratitude burst within my heart, and still there after 50 years, still motivates me to do God's will. But I got a printing press immediately and put it at home and began printing gospel tracts. I got a billboard uh, with scripture on it and put it in the front of our house. I gave out tracts to anyone I met. I shared the gospel with anyone I met. I had sign writing, professional sign writing, put on my car. I purchased a 34-seater big bus and had sign writing, 12 inches high, professional sign writing. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. On the front window of my business, I had John chapter 3, verses 1 to 16, for God so loved the world, etc., painted a professional three-inch sign writing so that people would hear the gospel. I got a soapbox, put it in the heart of our city, and began preaching the gospel to people that did that almost every day for 12 years. So if anyone could have been considered a religious nut in those days, it was me. Nowadays, I'm much worse because I've got everlasting life. And so there's this explosion of gratitude. People say, how come you're so zealous? Look, I'm a normal biblical Christian. When you read the book of Acts, they exploded with gratitude. And at the peril of their lives, they preached the gospel that Christ died for our sins. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's my testimony. That's why I'm a Christian and that's why I'm alive. I want to share the love of God by any means possible. Now, let me tell you what happened. After I wrote the book, My Friends Are Dying, I began getting trusts give me money to print these books and print literature to prevent kids getting into drugs. This is like 40 years ago. How old were you at that time? I was in my mid-20s. So I wrote this book and it became a bestseller. And uh, I began <laughs> to get a high profile in our country as a drug expert. I really didn't know anything about drugs except for that LSD thing. But I had this drug prevention center that I ran. And the reason that was a prevention center is I use Christianity as a means of prevention. If you're a Christian, you won't want to take drugs because you love God and you want to keep your body clean of that which is uh, impure. And I remember at one point, a national television program called up and says, can we come and interview you? Uh, Someone's died in prison. Someone snuck drugs into prison and he's dead and we want to interview about that. And I said, sure, come around now. Put the phone down. I thought, I don't know anything about that. And I looked up and there was two drug addicts that were in the drug center. And I said, excuse me, can you come here? Can you tell me how they get drugs in prison? And they said, yes, they inject oranges with LSD. They put it under postage stamps. They sneak it in this way, this way, and that way. And about 20 minutes later, there I was on national television sharing how they get drugs into prison through stamped, postage stamps. And, and so I became this drug expert and it gave me a high profile and it gave me the ability to share the gospel. And from that, an itinerant ministry opened up where I would go to churches and teach how to share the gospel because it became known that I preached the gospel in the heart of our city. I began doing that for many years and then I got an invitation to go to Hawaii and teach. So we went there and taught somebody sat in the teaching, and the teaching I did was a radical teaching called Hell's Best Kept Secret. Let me give you a little synopsis of why it's kind of different. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and that's what we should do, share the gospel with people. But when you look at scripture, something strange happens before the gospel is preached, and that is, it's epitomized in how Jesus dealt with the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler ran to him and said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
And Jesus said, why do you call me good? And they said, you know the commandments. And he gave them the Ten Commandments. He said, what's that for? Well, it's to bring the knowledge of sin. It's what happened to me on the night of my conversion. You've heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. Seventh commandment. But I said, you ever looks upon a woman that brought the knowledge of sin. It's very similar to a, a doctor who's got a cure he wants to give to a patient who thinks he's healthy. Patient says, I'm really well and healthy. Should he give him the cure or should he show him the x-rays? Well, he shouldn't give him the cure because he won't want it because he thinks he's well. He should show him the x-rays. And the x-rays will show him his neighbor. He thinks, wow, I'm in terrible dire straits, going to be dead in two weeks. What should I do? Now he's ready for the gospel because he's seen his disease. My teaching I did called Hell's Best Kept Secret just says you've got to open up the commandments. You've got to show them the x-rays before you bring the cure of the gospel. So a pastor sat in the teaching in Hawaii and he disagreed at first. And so I gave him literature to read and he began becoming convinced that it's very biblical and it was used by Spurgeon, Wesley, Whitfield, Moody, all those down through the ages. They always preceded the gospel with a moral law, the Ten Commandments to bring the knowledge of sin. And eventually he invited us to base our ministry in Southern California, particularly to bring the teaching to the church in the United States. So we prayed about it and over a three day period, 13 really weird things happened to show us we should come to the US. It was really God's hand directing us. Uh, just one of those things was, I mentioned to a friend, I'm thinking of selling my house. He bought it on the spot, just like that, bought my house. I thought, what is going on? Even my mum, who was Jewish, said, when she got real upset when I said, we're going to live to you in the US, she got really mad, but then she admitted that three days earlier, God had spoken to her heart and said, we're going to live in the U.S. So it was 13 different things happened like that. So he came to the U.S. to bring this teaching and things were very quiet for the first three years until I got a phone call from a preacher named David Wilkerson, a very famous preacher, wrote a book called The Cross and the Switchblade and he'd heard the teaching. He flew me to New York where I shared it with his church and then another minister heard about it filmed me teaching it to a thousand pastors and he screened that video to 30,000 pastors. So suddenly I had this ministry that just landed in my lap and it was God opening doors. And then sometime after that, the actor, Kirk Cameron, from Growing Pains, heard the teaching. He didn't even register what it meant the first time he heard it. It didn't register to him and he listened to it again and suddenly hit him how important it was. So he called me and he wanted to combine ministries. And he kept saying for about 12 months, how can we get this teaching to the church? He wanted it to explode and to bring it to the church. And opportunity came that he got to preach Hell's Best Kept Secret on an international Christian television program. Our website got over a million hits, actually collapsed. And the network said, come back and do some more of this teaching. He said, no, what we'll do is we'll create a television program teaching Christians how to share their faith. And we called it The Way of the Master. It's now in its ninth season, and it goes to 190 countries. So I'm in awe at what God has done with this little nobody from nowhere who has nothing but a love for God. Ray, what was, what was the reaction even just going a little bit back here, what, what was the reaction of your wife, your family, your friends in that initial moment when you said, man, this is, I need to run for Jesus. You mentioned that you had a good life, you had a good job, everything was good. And now you're radical, you know, putting, doing all of these things for the Lord. What was the people around you? What was their reaction as they were seeing you transform in this way? Well, my wife, Sue, was brought up in a Christian home, so she understood. She was very, very uh, accommodating. The night of my conversion, I actually called her just after I got saved because she let me go on a surfing trip. We were newly married. She didn't complain that I was leaving her for three days to go on a surfing trip 100 miles away. So I called and said, are you lonely? And she says, yeah. And I said, well, don't worry because God is with you. <laughs> I'd never spoken that, like that before. And she immediately knew what had happened. And so I came back. My mum and dad were, um, my dad was understanding. My mum was a little standoffish, being Jewish. My brother and sister were kind of standoffish, and they, they've softened over the years, which is wonderful. But uh, I, I can't blame them because I, it wasn't normal, you know, to see someone transform like this. But I found, you know, if I could go back and talk to myself, I would say, 
get your doctrine worked out before you share the gospel. And it's an easy thing to work out. And this is, this is what to work out. Salvation is of the Lord. God saves people. We don't. Because I ran around getting little prayers said by people, getting decisions from something like nearly 30 of my friends. Because I thought that's all there was to it. I'd pray, God, forgive my sins. So you do this and you'll have what I have. And I created a lot of false converts. And I actually badgered my mum and dad in a nice, loving way. But I did badger them. I was like a bull in a china shop. And, and now if I go back and do it again, I'd say to myself, be rich in good works. Because family aren't impressed with words. They're impressed with works. They want to see your faith by your works. The Bible says, so is the will of God by your well-doing. You're put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So if you're wanting your family to be saved, just buy them gifts when it's not Christmas. Show them love. Mow the lawn when you're not asked to. Do the dishes when you're not supposed to. And they'll say, whoa, what's happened here? And uh, works, good works can speak louder than a thousand sermons preached from the housetops. Ray, who is Jesus to you? He's my savior. He's the creator of the universe. I don't breathe without his will. He's the one that pulled me out of the grave, so to speak. I talked before about gratitude. Um, I can't put into words how grateful I am. I can't tell you how lost I was the night that I cried out, why? I was horrified at the futility of life. When I got saved, I was like a drowning man who's just pulled out of the water at the last second. And so gratitude explodes within my heart and it hasn't gone down. After 50 years, it's just as strong. And gratitude is the high octane fuel that drives me to do the will of God. If you follow me around, you'll find that 24 hours a day, almost, I'm serving the Lord. Right in the middle of the night, I'm editing videos for our YouTube channel. Twice a day, I get on a bike with my dog wearing sunglasses. We go to local college. Twice a day, where I interview people and share my, my faith. And all of that, book writing, etc., is all motiv motivated by the fuel of gratitude. And it comes back to, he that is forgiven much, the same loves much. You see, before I was a Christian, as a young businessman, Long hair though I had, I was kind of clean cut as a guy when I worked in the bank. If you had summed me up, you'd say, he's a good young moral man. He's married, got a house, he's doing a good job. Mm -mm. I was burning with unlawful sexual desire like every guy. Eyes full of adultery, drinking and nectary like water. And if God in his holiness had done that which is right, he could have picked me up and damned me in hell and done that which is right and good and just, but instead of giving me justice, he gave me mercy. So when I look at the cross, it breaks my heart that Christ could love me that much, a wretch like me. And I don't say that because it sounds spiritual. I mean it from my heart. I'm so grateful that I'm saved from death and I'm saved from the grave and the horrors that this world lives in. To think that there are literally billions of people out there that are tormented by the fear of death. That's what it says in the book of Hebrews. They are held captive by the fear of death all their lifetime. And so when I share the gospel with students around at the local college, I say to them, do you think there's an afterlife? And they say, yeah, I don't know. Do you think about it much? Yeah, all the time. I say, you're afraid of death? And they go, yes. And I look in their eyes and I can see they're thinking, how did this guy know? They're saying, I don't share this with mum or dad or my friends. I don't even think about it. It so haunts me, but he's brought it out of me. I'm terrified of dying. And so my motivation for sharing the gospel is an empathy with people just like I was. And we've got the most glorious gospel in the world. Jesus Christ has abolished death. That's what the Bible says. And brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Old Testament, God promised he'd destroy death. And in the New Testament, we're told how he did it. So if you're a normal biblical Christian, you too will be a crazy man or crazy woman. You too will seek to save that which is lost. And you too will look at Jesus on that cross and say, oh God, you did that for me. I'll do anything for you. So Jesus is my Lord. He's my savior. He's my very life as scripture says. Ray, for those who are watching and, you know, maybe you're saying, I've called out to Jesus many times and nothing happens. You know, I've, I've said the sinner's prayer. I've stayed up at night saying, God, help me come into my life and nothing happened. Nothing changes. 
What would you say to that person that's watching right now? Well, first, I'd read the Sermon on the Mount and get a good revelation of the spiritual nature of the law. The Bible says of the Messiah, he shall magnify the law and make it honorable. And that's exactly what Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher who ever lived. He expounded that law. Get angry without cause. You're in danger of judgment. The Bible says if you hate someone, you commit murder. If you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. So every time you look with lust, and for guys particularly, that's like a hundred times a day. You've committed adultery every time you've done that. So get a glimpse of your own sinfulness and realize that if God is just, you would be damned in hell. Realize that you're worthy of death. The wages of sin is death. God is paying you in death for your sins. And then secondly, once you've understood your, your sin against God, Ask him to help you to be contrite, to be genuinely sorry, to find a place of biblical repentance because the Bible says God grants repentance. He helps us repent because we're so wicked and so hard-hearted. And then exercise faith. Now, most people have got a wrong understanding of what faith is. Some people think faith is believing in God despite the lack of evidence. That is ridiculous. There's more evidence for God than anything. Creation testifies to the genius of God's creative hand. The building tells us there's a builder. The painting tells us there's a painter. The painter could have died 100 years ago, but we still know there was a painter because paintings don't paint themselves. So creation, flowers and birds and trees, the sun, the moon, the stars, puppies, kittens, the marvels of the human eye, the miracle of childbirth, everything we see around us screams at the genius of God's creative hand. So we know God exists. We don't need faith. Don't have faith that there was a builder. You know there was a builder, because buildings don't build themselves. When the Bible speaks of faith, it means trusting in his integrity. And people don't realize this, that if you have a lack of faith in God, you're insulting him. If I say to you, what's your name? And you tell me, I say, I don't believe that. You're going to be insulted. I say, where do you live? And you say, down such and such a road. I say, I don't believe that either. If I don't believe you, it means I think you're a liar, you're a deceiver, you're trying to pull the wool over my eyes. I don't trust you. Now try saying that to your boss. I don't trust you. You're going to be without a job. Say it to your spouse. You're going to be sleeping on the couch. We trust our doctors. We trust our dentists. We trust brain surgeons. We trust pilots. We exercise trust all over the place. Well, if we can trust man who is fallible, how much more should we trust God? When he says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Believe that, because the Bible says, he that believes not God has made him a liar. Let none of you depart through the, from the living God through an evil heart of unbelief. So just as you never mistrust your spouse or your brain surgeon or your pilot, you just trust them, trust in God. Trust him with all your heart and don't go by your feelings. If I went by feelings, I'd never evangelize. If I went by feelings, I'd think I was unsaved. My salvation is dependent upon the promises of God. And as I believe God's promises, I have joy. The Bible speaks of joy and peace in believing. If I said I'm going to give you a million dollars in 20 minutes, and as a down payment, I'll give you 100,000 right now. You'd look at it and say, whoa, I've got a million coming <laughs> you know, in, a, in, a, in a half an hour. You'd have an instant joy in believing. Money's coming. You know it's coming. Well, believe God's promises and you'll have joy in believing. We have joy and peace in believing, scriptures say. So that's the stumbling block for most who never get anywhere. They say, God, I've asked this Jesus into my heart, nothing happened. Well, there's this lack of genuine deep repentance and a lack of trust in the promises of God. He has faithfully promised. Abraham staggered not at the promise of God, but he was strong in faith, being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. So believe God's promises. Hmm. Ray, how long have you been faithfully walking with Jesus now? It was April the 25th, 1.30 in the morning, 1972. So it's something like 51 years or something like that. What is the, the greatest lesson in, in these last 50 plus years of you walking with Jesus? What is the greatest lesson that you've learned as you've been walking with him? It's what I've known for a all the time of being a Christian, and that is lay it all down. Silly little kid story, or silly kid's little story, about a train uh, that wanted to be free from the confines of the track. It was called Tootle, or something like that. It come down this 
hill. He'd look over at the lambs and the little ponies leaping in the fields, and he was envious. He didn't want to be stuck on those tracks. So one day he jumped the, one day he jumped the tracks, and all he got was disaster because a train isn't designed to find freedom leaping about in a field. It's designed to find freedom within the confines of the track. And that's the key to successful Christianity. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. That's a yoke. And learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest to your soul. So become yoked to Christ. Give him everything. There's nothing in my life that I've held back. About a month after I was a Christian, I remember kneeling down in my, my business and just saying, God, I give you everything. I realize what I've got now. I've got everlasting life. Nothing else matters. I give you my business. I give everything to you. And I think the next day, a guy I didn't know walked into my store. And he says, you're out of here. You don't have a lease. Get out. I've bought this place. And I was out. I had no business. And I started making jackets from home. And the city came around and says, oh, you can't do this. This is manufacturing in a residential area. You've got to get out of here. So I got kicked out of my house making jackets. And that made me move to the square in the heart of town where I began open air preaching. So it seems that God's hand guided me. But that key, that key was laying it all down that day. Nothing is held back. He, he gave me everything. The breath I breathe is by his permission. I have eyes because he gave them to me, a brain that works because he gave me a mind that works. Mm -hmm. And so I, I realized that it's my reasonable service. And Paul says to the Romans, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, they present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So lay it all down and he'll give it all back. Ray, I just want to want to honor you. Um, you know, part of the the reason why this channel exists is because you you've been so adamant in sharing the gospel. And uh, in the moment that I gave my life to Jesus, I was looking for the gospel because somebody at my church asked me. One of my leaders asked me and said, "What is the gospel?" And I couldn't answer. I couldn't answer what the gospel was, and so I began searching, and I came across your channel. And I was, honestly, I got bored. And the reason I got bored is because I was like, he's, he's saying the same thing over and over. I was like, why is he saying the same thing? I didn't know what the gospel was, you know? And uh, at some point, the Lord revealed to me, he's sharing the gospel. And it came alive in my life. And, and that's when I, I truly believe through that seed and through other seeds that were planted in lots of prayer, obviously, from family and friends, um, I laid down my life completely. And I think that's why... A major part of why we're here. So I just wanted to honor you um, for your work and what you have done and what the Lord has done through you. For those who are watching, who are in that place, who maybe are listening to you right now and are saying, you know what, I, I want to be all in. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to have what, what Ray has and I want to be there. I want to do that. Could you pray for those who are watching right now? Yeah, I'd love to. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that. It's very encouraging. Father, we pray for those that are watching, for any Christians that have not laid it all down, that this would be the moment that they present their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. Help them to understand that uh, you have the right to everything they have because you're the maker of their soul and body and every blessing that's come their way came by your permission. So may this day they be truly born again May there be a spark, a fire, uh, begin within their lives where they say with the disciples, we cannot but speak that which was seen and heard. And may you use them in a wonderful way to reach this dying world with this glorious gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, everybody. I hope the New Testimony has blessed you, has encouraged you. Just wanted to let you know that if you are in need of help, that we have people that are ready to speak with you. So down in the description box below, in the comment section, uh, if you're watching from YouTube, if you're listening from our podcast, just look for the link that says, talk to someone who cares. Click on that, fill out the form, and somebody will get in contact with you locally. Now, this is only available to people in the U.S. right now, but we are working to get resources for our international viewers and listeners. But for right now, if you are in the U.S. and you need help, you need to talk with somebody, please fill out that form and somebody will reach out to you. God bless you, and we'll see you on the next testimony.